welcome all our Facebook uh, uh, members, listeners. We want to welcome you uh, to our Sunday morning service. Uh, you're going to enjoy uh, this morning's word. We are working. I know uh, uh, people here in the church keep asking me, are we ever going to put our praise and worship back up? I said, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Uh, as of right now, we cannot put our, our praise and worship through uh, Facebook Live. So we normally start it uh, during the message time at 1030. Sometimes if they do go over, you do get a little piece of it. But uh, for right now, uh, till we get all the kinks worked out, we cannot uh, play our praise and worship through Facebook Live. So we've been talking on the origin of the law, the origin of the law. And if you, Romans 8, 2, the TVs aren't on. Romans 8, 2, it says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin. Words' sake, I shortened it out to the the law of life and the law of death. You know, but uh, understand that when I say the law of life, I'm talking about the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And when I talk about the law of death, I'm talking about the law of sin and death. You know, so one of the things that uh, we established is we need to realize what law is. And there's two definitions for the word law. The first one is the system of rules that a particular country or community recognizes as regulating and actions of its members and may enforce by the imposition of penalties. In other words, these are rules that uh, a government sets up, a church sets up, an institution sets up, you know, to govern themselves. Uh, let me say this. Uh, uh, every institution, if it's going to function properly, has to have a set of rules to govern itself. This church, even though we are a grace-based church, where uh, if you follow me, you're going to hear me say that we are not under the law, we are not under the Ten Commandments. If you follow me closely on that, but in order for us to function as a church, we have to have rules, or else we'd have chaos. <laughs> Amen? You know, so, so don't get the idea, because we teach, you know, that we're not under the law, uh, don't get the idea that I'm talking about being lawless. You know, when I say we're not under the law, what I'm referring to, so you might want to write this down somewhere, what pastor's referring to is you cannot please God by obeying the law. Amen? You cannot get closer to God by obeying the law. Let me, let me hit you a little low. He loved you when you were rotten. What makes you think he's not going to love you now? <laughs> Amen? I mean, when I was rotten to the core, he loved me and sent his son to die for me. Now if I don't follow a set of rules, he's going to love me less? Are you following what I'm saying? So when I, when I talk, when I say we're not under the law, uh, I'm referring to that I can't please God by obeying the Ten Commandments. I can't get closer to God by obeying these commandments. The purpose of God giving this command, these commandments was not so they would become a form of government for the church, 
but to prove to the Israelites that they couldn't keep them. Amen? You know, I was out working, cutting the weeds, and my son, when he was three years old, he came and he wanted that hose. And I say, no, because you're not going to be able to do it right. And he kept tugging that he wanted it, so finally, here, I gave it to him. Did I give it to him because I knew he was going to be able to do a good job? Why did I give it to him? To prove to him that he wasn't going to be able to do it right. He grabbed it. It's still there. Hit it again. Hit it again. Hit it again. I can't do it, Dad. Give it to me. Let me do it for you. The Jews said, Moses, go tell God. You read it in chapter 19 of Exodus. Go tell God that whatever he says, we can do. And God's tone changes there. From verse 1 to, to that point, God is saying, I brought you on eagle's wings. I brought you to myself. And he's talking on how he wants to bless them. But the moment they say, go tell Moses, go tell God that whatever he commands, we can do it. God says, get away from me. Separate yourself from me. No one touches this mountain. Anybody that touches this mountain is going to surely die. Why? Because there's basically what they were saying was, Lord, judge us by our actions. Don't judge us by your goodness. Judge us by our actions. And listen, when you want to, when you, when you get the idea that if I could just obey the Ten Commandments, I'll be pleasing to God, basically what you're telling God is, God, judge me by my actions. And truthfully, you never want to be judged by your actions. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. You never want to be judged by your actions. You want to be judged by his goodness because he's good. Amen. The second definition is a statement of fact deduced from observations to you, the effect that particular natural or scientific phenomenon always occurs if certain conditions are present. My simple definition to that is it's constant. It never changes. It's constant. When something is constant and never changes, it's a law. It's a principle. And those are good laws. I'll give you an example. What does the law of gravity say? What goes up must come down. That's a constant. I don't care how light the thing is. If it went up, it might take it a while. And the wind might catch it and blow it up again. But it will eventually find itself to the floor. Why? It's constant. If I take a seed and I put it on the dashboard of my car, what will happen to that seed? Absolutely nothing. Because I'm not meeting the scientific criteria. But if I meet the criteria and I take that seed and I plant it in soil and I add water, what's going to happen? It's going to grow a plant. That's a law. That's a principle. In other words, it always works. In the Bible, there are laws, there are principles that if you put them to work, they will always work. The law of faith will always work when you operate in the law of faith. 
The law of love will always operate if you were up and work in the law of love. If you love people, people will love you back. I think I need to say that again. If you love people, people will love you back. Okay, I didn't want to go there, but I'm going to go there. If you love yourself, you'll love people, and people will love you back. <laughs> Let me say that again. If you love yourself, you will love people, and people will love you back. You say, what do you mean love yourself? You can't love people if you can't love yourself. Now, that's good teaching right there. You know, uh, one of the commandments, they asked Jesus, uh, what is the greatest commandments of the law? He said, love your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your soul. And then he added, and yourself, and your neighbor, love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, you have to love yourself first before you can love your neighbor. And this is what happens many times. You go to the mirror and you say, man, how stupid could you have been? How could you have done that? How stupid could you have been? And then you come over here and you meet with Jenna, and Jenna gives me a, why are you looking at me that way? You think I'm stupid or what? And guess what Jenna's going to say? Yeah! <laughs> Are you following me? You have to love yourself to be able to love people. The law of love, listen, the law of love will always work. But you've got to love yourself first. Once you love yourself, you can love people, and people will love you back. We also stated that the origin of the law started in God. The the origin of the law of life. God is life, and it starts in God. If Sister Liz is dying of thirst, and I offer her some of my water that I just drank, and she says, no, because you, you have germs. What is going to happen to Sister Liz? She's going to die. Why? Because she rejected a drink of life. The sin, uh, the law of death, the law of death is a byproduct of the law of life. Because the law of life is God offering you his life to you if he is life and you reject life, what do you, what's the alternative? Death. You know, I went to Texas. I went to Texas uh, to do a funeral, and, and uh, my, I have an 85-year-old cousin. He's still, walk, he's still walking around without a cane. I said, that's, a, that's all I want to be when I'm 85 years old, walking around without a cane, you know. And he looks at me, and he goes, Eli! I go, yeah, primo. He goes, you know, I didn't want to get old. I was refusing to get old. I did not want to get old. He goes, but my only option was to die young. So I chose to get old. <laughs> what am I saying? If you, if you refuse life, if you refuse the law of life which originates from God, what's your alternative? It's death. The alternative is death. And it's not because God doesn't want you. You know, I've been reading and they've been uh, posting it a, a couple of times. And it says this, uh, this little quote on Facebook. It says, God's hell is not full of people, of, 
Hell is not full of people that God rejected. Hell is full of people that rejected God. If you reject life, your only option is death. And it's not because God wants you dead. I mean, in Ezekiel, he writes, he writes, uh, tell the people that uh, as I live, says the Lord, I do not want the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should repent. So he's telling you, hey, listen, I'm the only life, but if you reject me, your only option is death. I didn't want to get old. Like my cousin said, I didn't want to get old, but my only option was to die young, so I chose to get old. <laughs> you know, it's funny, but it's, that's the truth. If you don't want to get old, the only option is die young, and you won't get old. So we choose and we fight with all our might to stay alive and get old. Amen? That's why I go to the doctors. You know, and I tell the Lord, I said, Lord, I want to I wanna live till I'm 85, 90. It don't matter if I'm old. I can't say it doesn't matter if I lose my hair. I've already lost it. So it doesn't matter if it turns gray. <laughs> There's nothing to turn gray. I take that back. I noticed the other day on my arm hairs, they were turning white. <laughs> Listen to the origin of the law of life started in Christ Jesus. And the law of death was a byproduct. Definition to the law of life. Definition to the law of life. The definition to the law of life is God imparting his life to a dead thing. He took some clay. He formed the body of it, out of it. And then he... He imparted his life into it. He offered it his life and he imparted his life to it. And that uh, form that he made, he called it Adam. And that clay became a living soul when he blew the breath of life into it. So the definition of the law of life is God imparting his life. God imparting his life to me. God imparting his life to you. Amen? The definition of the law of death, the definition of the law of death is me thinking that through my own efforts, if I could just imitate the life of God, I could produce it on my own. That's the law of death. It's me imitating. Me imitating the law, the life of God, me imitating the life of God and thinking I can produce that same life. This is why it's kind of weird, uh, uh, and, and I, I, I try to put my brain around it, but you know, only the Holy Spirit will, uh, can, uh, has revealed it. But this is why, listen to what I'm saying, this is why uh, uh, the law, the Ten Commandments, is holy. Because it describes the life of God. It describes the life of God. 
But this is why it's bad for you to try to imitate it. Because when you try to submit yourself to that holy life that is described in those Ten Commandments, you are trying to produce that same life on your own without having that life on the inside of you. Are you following what I'm saying? So when I subject myself to the Ten Commandments and I subject myself to try to obey them and keep them, basically what I'm doing is I'm cutting myself off of the life source and saying I can produce, if I could just obey this one commandment, I would be a good, perfect Christian. And how many know you just set yourself up for failure? I remember I used to pray that when I was back in Bible school. Lord, if I could just overcome this one fault. If I could just overcome this one fault, I'd be the best Christian. There's a lot of things wrong with that statement. If I could overcome this fault, I'd be a a good Christian. That that, That sounds nice, right? But that statement is so full of undoubt and unbelief. And if some of you were like me, we all we we actually put it in prayer. Oh God, please help me overcome this. Please, Lord, if you would just help me to overcome this fault, if you would just help me to overcome this sin, I would be a good Christian. I would be able to serve you properly if you would just help me to overcome it. And that's, again, everybody in my church, when I used to pray, because, you know, I have a loud voice, and I, uh, we were taught you prayed loud, you don't pray quietly. You know, so everybody would hear me praying that prayer. Man, he, he's one of the best youth we have. He's a good Christian, loves God. Didn't bother to ask what the fault was I was trying to overcome. Uh, are you following what I'm saying? But that, that was, even though it's, it would sounded like a good spiritual prayer, it was a prayer full of doubt and unbelief. If I could just overcome this fault, denial to what Jesus said, he who the sun set free is free indeed. Right? If I could just overcome this fault, Jesus said, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. If I could just overcome this fault, that means I'm not free yet. Doubt number two, I'd be a good Christian, meaning that I'm not. You're either a Christian or you're not. Amen? Amen? You're either a monkey or you're human. <laughs> For those of you who have been in my, li- in my previous sessions, I talked about this. You could dress a monkey and make him look like human. Have him open and answer the door, serve you tea and have coffee with him. But he's still a monkey. Amen? Hallelujah. My my thought is my my uh, my purpose is not to make sinners look like Christian. My purpose here is to turn sinners into Christian. Have them transformed, born again, and change completely from a, a life of sin to a life of righteousness. Amen. And the, listen to what I'm going to say because I know this is going to hit you hard. And the only way to do that is quit trying to do it on your, on your own. Give it up. You can't do it. Cry out to your Savior and say, Jesus, 
I need a Savior. I need a Savior to save me from pornography. I need a Savior to uh, save me from adultery. I need a Savior to save me from drug addiction. I need a Savior to save me from gossip. I need a Savior to save me from lying and cheating and stealing. You can't do it on your own. You need a Savior. I needed a Savior. Listen, when you cry out for that Savior, the law of life comes into you because you've realized you can never imitate that life. Those Ten Commandments describe God's holy life And that's why they're holy. But you can never imitate them. They have to be birthed in you. And when that holy life is birthed in you, you, you'll go above and beyond the Ten Commandments. Instead of trying to steal from people, you'll be blessing people. Amen? Amen? Let me say that again. Instead of trying to steal from people, you will be blessing people. You won't be trying to take away from them. You'll be trying to give to them. The way you reject the way you reject the spirit of life listen to what I'm going to say. The way you reject the spirit of life is not by going out sinning. That's the effects of the rejection. Let me say it again. The way you reject the the spirit of life is not by going out drinking, smoking, gambling, committing adultery. That's not how you reject it. That's the effect of your rejection. The way you reject it is when you try to imitate it and produce it on yourself. I want you to open, because I, I, I want to leave that statement uh, clarified in the Bible. Go to Romans chapter 7. Verse, we're going to start on verse 6. Romans chapter 7, verse 6. And I keep putting the rest, I'll tell you where to stop. But, but now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of letter. What shall I say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not lust. In other words, he's saying, is the law sin? No, it's not. It's not sin. But on the other hand, he's he's giving you two. Is the law sin? And what's the answer? Is the law sin? What's the answer? No. But on the other hand, this is what he's saying. But on the other hand, I would have not known lust if the law didn't say thou shalt not lust. Amen? In other words, I found out lust was wrong when the law said thou shalt not lust. I'll give you an example. There's a stop sign right here. But as you're driving out of the parking lot, there's no stop sign. Now, we all know to stop before we drive into the street, but there's no stop sign. Amen? So I I don't have to make a stop. Are, Are you following what I'm saying? But there's a stop sign here. That's that that stop sign 
You know what that stop sign is there for? You want me to tell you what that stop sign is there for? It's not to stop you. Because that stop sign cannot do anything to stop you. It's a, it's a, it's a piece of metal that says stop, and it cannot do absolutely anything to stop you. But you know why it's there? So that the police officer has the right to pull you over and give you a ticket and charge you a fine. Because if that stop sign wasn't there and he pulled you over, he would have said, there's no stop sign there, but you should know better that you should look both ways before you drive onto ongoing traffic the way we do here. Are you following what I'm saying? So that stop sign is there not to stop you, but so that the police officer has the right to stop you. And give you that ticket. But it's never to stop you. It has no power to stop you. But it gives the officer the right to stop you. And charge you a fine. Are you seeing what Paul is saying? That stop sign makes me aware that I'm going to do something that it can cause me harm, can cost me some money if I don't obey it. But it does nothing inside of me. And that's what he's saying. Now, let's keep reading. But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, Sin was dead. For I was alive. And if you stop and, stop and think about this, in the first Pentecost, in the first Pentecost, the Spirit of God came over Mount Sinai, wrote with his finger the Ten Commandments, and if you read the story, 3,000 men died. 3,000 men died. Many years later, they had another Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit came down as a rushing mighty wind. And instead of writing on stones commandments, he came and abode in their hearts. And 3,000 people received eternal life. Ooh, I don't know about you, but I like that second one. When the 10 were written, 3,000 people died. When the 120 were in the upper room, 3,000 people got saved, received eternal life. Why? Because it was birthed into them. This one was a written exterior, and now they have to try to imitate it and produce the life which is causing them death. Now, listen to what it does. Verse 10. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me.
says that when that law came, it produced all kinds of evil concupiscence within me. Listen to what I'm going to say. If you're caught, if you're caught under this dilemma, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, that's what I do. If you're caught in that dilemma, you're in the same dilemma Paul is going to describe next. You know, and I, I was in that dilemma for many years where I want to be a good Christian. I want to serve God. I want to go to church. I, 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 I want to have a good life with my family. You know, I, I, and, 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 but the things, I don't want to get angry. I don't want to get mad. I, uh, the things that I wanted to do, it just seemed impossible for me to do. And the things that I didn't want to do, Blowing up on people, holding grudges against people, you know, hating people. The things that I did not want to do, they came so easy for me to do. You want me to tell you why I was in that dilemma? I was under the law. I was trying to serve God under the law. Folks, I don't hate people. I love people. Hallelujah. I don't hold grudges against people. I don't hold grudges against people. Amen? I don't hold grudges against people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know I look mean, but I'm not. <laughs> Amen. I always used to say this about Pastor Josh. I always say this about Pastor Josh. I always used to say, Pastor Josh, he has a, a beautiful, appealing face, but he'll bat your head off if you do something wrong. On the other, on the other hand, I, I scare people off. I know. My, I, I, I've had very few real good, good friends, but most of my good, good friends, they've always told me this. When I first saw you, I thought I'd hate you. I thought you'd be an, uh, a difficult person to get along with. He goes, but getting to know you, you you're an okay guy. <laughs> I'm an okay guy, okay? <laughs> but, but listen, I don't hold, I, I used to be very grudgeful, very vengeful. I don't do that anymore. Why? Because I learned that I don't serve God under the law. And when I, when I quit trying to serve God under the commandments, th th this, is, this is what I want you to see. When you quit trying to serve God under the commandments, you take off, you take the dam that's, that's blocking the flow of God's life in you out of the way. And now God's life begins to flow through you. And what you had been trying to produce on your own for many years becomes natural to you. If I take a lemon branch and graft it onto an orange tree, what will it give? Sour lemons or sweet lemons? It's going to give sweet. Do you want me to tell you why it's going to give sweet? Because it's now receiving the sap, the life of the orange tree. Are you following what I'm saying? As long as you're in this self-righteous tree where I have to do good to earn good, to please God, you're going to be producing lemons. But when you are grafted into this faith tree, where I believe, I believe that the life of God is flowing through me. I believe that I have His nature in me. 
I'm going to start producing his life. Go to 2 Peter. I want you to see this in scripture because uh, I've uh, said this a couple of times and not giving you the scripture. Chapter 1, verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. By which hand You either believe you have it or you believe you don't. And if you're trying to cultivate it in you, you're telling me you don't believe you have it. So you're going to be that Romans 7 guy. I'm trying to, Pastor Eli, I'm trying to do good. I'm trying to serve God to the best of my ability. I don't know why I just keep failing time and time again. Quit trying and establish that relationship with the Holy Spirit through faith and start believing this is who I am. This is not who you want to be. This is not who you should be. This is who you are. Hallelujah. Do it a little louder, Sister Liz. This is who you are. Listen, the, the, the problem is not me trying to get you to trying to be. You're already doing it. My uh, purpose is to get you to believe that you are. I am. This is who I am. I am a Christian. I've been born again. I've been bought by the blood of Jesus. I've been sanctified. I've been made righteous. I've been made holy. How many know Jesus was righteous? How many know that you're just as righteous as he, Jesus is? Amen? Listen, you've got to realize Jesus is not any more holier than what you are. Jesus is not any more righteous than what you are. Hallelujah. You say, how can you say that, Pastor? Well, whose life do you have on the inside of you? You have Jesus' life in, on the inside of you. So if that doesn't make you as righteous and as holy as he is, then maybe he doesn't have that, that righteous and holy life as we think he has. You need to quit seeing yourself apart from him and begin to see yourself in union with him. And listen, I know, I know that uh, if you come from the church that I came from, for God is holy, he's so holy, he's way up there, and, and we're so sinful, we're way down here, this concept is possibly blowing your mind. If you're like me, back in the 1980s, I heard this from A.W. Kenyon, and I said, that old man's gone cuckoo. Amen. Because, you know, W.E. Kenyon gave this definition to righteousness. And I, I could not accept this definition. Now, I accept it now, 
But at that time, back in 1985, I could not accept this de definition from E.W. Kenyon on righteousness. This was his definition. Uh, to be able to stand before the Father without an inferior complex. I said, well, that, 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 uh, stand before God without an inferior complex? Stand before God without an inferior. He's God. He's holy. I'm, I'm a sinful man. What do you mean I'm going to... Righteousness means that I can stand before God without an inferior complex. That's wrong. That's crazy. Because we all know all humans are inferior to God. Well, aren't you created in his class? Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Listen, my son, he's very respectful to me, and he honors me. He honors me. Listen to what I'm saying. He honors me. He's very respectful, and he honors me. He revers me. But he is not inferior to me. Now, I'd like to think that he is. <laughs> Like most parents do. I'm human. You know, but your, your children are not inferior to you. They have the same brain. They have the same eyes. They have the same ears. They have the same bones. They have the same muscles. And then they could do the same things you do. Just teach them how to do them. And they could probably do them better. Listen, they're not inferior. That they honor you is different because of your position, but they're not inferior. God made me in his class. God made you in his class. That we honor him because he is our life source, and we should. You should always honor God and never be like Lucifer. And, and try to go independent from God. Amen? But always honor him. Because he is your life source. But you can stand before him without an inferior complex. See, when I was full of inferiority complex, I always walked around like this. Because I didn't want nobody seeing so I was protective. But now that I know who I am, I walk around like this. Confident of who I am. Confident of who I am. Amen? Confident of who I am. That's not all his definition. He said, and to be able to stand before Satan as his master. Oh, that, that one really blew my mind. Because that was when I was still in the defeated church. Any of you ever belong to the defeated church? Let me describe what the defeated... See, there's three churches. There's three churches. There's the defeated church, the militant church, and the victorious church, the triumphant church. The... Sad to say I've belonged to all three. <laughs> what time was I remember when I was in the defeated church. In the defeated church, we were all, oh, brothers, pray for me because the devil's after me. The devil's doing this and the devil is doing that. Oh, I'd never say that because if the devil hears you, he'll bring, he'll bring havoc in your life. So, shh, don't say it too loud. And we were so afraid of the devil. I mean, we were constantly, brother, pray for me because the devil is doing it. Brother, pray for me because we were in defeat. We say, we're going to open the service so that you could uh, give uh, testimonies and people will t get up and say, I want to thank God for saving me, but you pray for me that I'd hold on to the end because the devil is really working and, and manipulating things in my life. 
That's the defeated church. I belong to that church. Amen? The militant church, I joined that afterwards. You just got to take it by force. We got to... Uh, we got to pray out the devils out of Eloy. We got to pray the devils out of Cassegrain. And we got to just, listen, they're going to be here till Jesus comes back. <laughs> you just got to preach the gospel. Amen. Listen, to you just got to preach the gospel. Hallelujah. Listen to what I'm going to say. Listen to what I'm going to say. If Jesus couldn't keep them out of his meetings, what makes you think we're going to keep them out of our meetings? Amen? I mean, Jesus had a closed meeting. He only invited 12 guys. Him, 13. But you know the devil was there too. Without an invitation. You say, how do you know that? He went into he went into Judas. Right? Right smack in the middle in the middle of Jesus' meeting, Satan comes in, knocks on Judas' door, and Judas says, Come on in. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. But we're going to war them out of here. Listen, preach the gospel and people get saved and they'll leave. You know, Brother Hagin said this many years ago. He said, we, we would stay up all night uh, rebuking and casting out devils. When it, it would have been much better if we would have said, twinkle, twinkle, little star, what I wonder what you are. He said it had the same effect. <laughs> Amen. Yet we were there, militant, ready to fight. Listen, but I joined this triumphant church. I joined this triumphant church, for I live victoriously. For when the devil begins to create havoc, and I don't need to say how much havoc has been in our lives these past half year. We've soared like an eagle above the havoc. And yes, we hurt. Yes, we, I miss my loved ones. But I'm soaring like an eagle. I'm not going to be clucking like a chicken. Amen? Hallelujah. 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 Listen, listen, if, 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 if you're, if you're uh, wrestling with, I want to do this, you're in the defeated church. I hate to word it that way. You're in the defeated church because you're still under the law. The moment you realize and you start confessing, I am the righteousness of God. I am. Listen, I'm going to stop right here, but I, I want you to take this home with you. Every morning, the moment your eyes open, say, thank you, Father, because I am a new creation created in Christ Jesus. I am holy. I am righteous. All things are passed away. All my old habits, all my negative emotions have passed away. Behold, everything is made new. Say that confession about yourself. Read 1 Corinthians 14, uh, 13. And when you get to that part, uh, starting on verse 4, where it says, love, love is kind, say, I am kind. Because you will have love. I am kind. I am long-suffering. Begin to say those things to yourselves. And begin to believe them. 
As you begin to believe him, the life of God will begin to give birth to that on the inside. Now let me tell you this. Is this going to cause a change overnight? No. It's the same way when you plant a seed, it does not give a tree overnight. But it begins to germinate and it begins to grow. It's the same thing that seed is being planted in your heart and it begins to grow. And when, by the time you realize it, people are going to, hey, you've really changed. There's something different about you. I remember when I, when I got married with my wife, Judah, my sister Esther, I went up to her and told her, Judah, I don't know what you did to Eli, but you really changed him. And I overheard her. I said, she didn't change me. Ain't no woman going to change me. And I said, how did she? She she said, you're more kind to people. But you know, she had a part in it. But it was, I had started reading 1 Corinthians 13 in the me person. 1 Corinthians 13, in the, this is who I am. I am kind. I am, uh, uh, I am long-suffering. I am not boastful. I, uh, I, I can't remember. But I, I would read it in the me person. This is who I am. And it began, it began to give fruit on the inside of me. And it began to grow. And then she began to teach me how to love. And, and I, I was able to begin to express that love to her. This is because I was bad. I mean, uh, for our first year, she was always crying. Because I had a look that could kill. You know, and I, I, can't, I can't even do that look anymore. <laughs> they knew that look. <laughs> You know, but I was angry with the world, so it was angry to. It was easy to uh, express anger to anybody. But when I began to plant that love in my heart, God and my wife did a good job on me. Amen. And He'll do the same work in you, but you have to start planting those seeds on the inside of you, and the way you do it is by waking up. At night times, when you go to bed, you know how sometimes it takes you five minutes? Some of you could just go to sleep as soon as you lay your head on the pillow. But some of you take five minutes to 10, 15, half an hour. Some of you take a whole hour. What do you do that whole hour? Oh, they're going to shut off the light. Oh, they're going to, oh, that worker at work, and you're, you're having a fight with the, your coworker at work. Well, instead of fighting with your co-worker at work before you go to sleep, start thinking, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Go to sleep. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am the holiness of God in Christ Jesus. I am the righteousness, the holiness of God. I, have, I am love, peace, joy. I am. This is who I am. And begin to go to sleep saying that to yourself. Like I said, you won't notice it, but in a month, if you do that for a whole straight month, people are going to say, something's wrong with you. Something's different in you. Because they're going to see the change. Confession proceeds possession. Let me say that again. Confession proceeds possession. You have to say it out first before you could have it. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you because it does not return void to us, but it does all that you have sent it out to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Haganayak, shake a hand. We are dismissed. Don't forget your children.